Hello, welcome to CTN Member Highlights. I'm Leslie McVeigh, and t today my guests are Bob and Sally Scheibo from Maine Voices for Palestinian Rights. Hi, welcome. Thank you. Thank you. Now, you've just returned from the West Bank. Mm -hmm. That's right. And I'd like to ask you, before we talk about what happened there, how did you um, come to go there? and stay for as long as you did. Bob, you were there for a month. Sally, yeah. you were there for two mm -hmm. weeks. Um, what was your uh, reason for going? And uh, we'll go from there. Well, as you said, we're both in Main Voices of Palestinian Right. I serve as the chair of that organization. This was our third trip there. And we go periodically. We intend to keep doing that so that we can stay fresh in our knowledge about what's happening on the ground. We like to let um, learn from people there. And we've discovered this time that they need to learn some things from us. In other words, they don't know how much is going on here. So we realized that we were, in a way, ambassadors to let them know that there are uh, a lot of organizations here, including a number of very strong Jewish organizations that are working on behalf of Palestinian justice and for a just peace for everyone there. And then, yes, and um, you know, as Bob said, um, this is our third time. And for me, the intention of this particular visit was to connect with Buddhists in the region, um, in Israel, um, I'm particularly interested in how to bring the Buddhist perspective, the being informed by Buddhist teachings, and um, how to have the Buddhist voice be part of an interfaith uh, presence. And so my, my intention was to talk to Buddhists in Israel and to see how we might work together, what I might learn from them, what I might bring back here, how I might then proceed. And that's all part of the Buddhist teaching, isn't it? To, to listen, to talk, to teach, to... Mm -hmm. And to, to be compassionate. Right. Yeah. That's lovely. I should probably add here that the more specific reason we went when we went is that last summer, a young um, Palestinian man in his late 30s, he was a history teacher there, he came over to Maine as part of the Seeds of Peace for Educators program. And he came a week early before the program, so Seeds of Peace sent out an email asking people to volunteer to host him. And so we were one of those who volunteered, and he stayed with us for three days, and we just pretty much fell in love with him, and I think it was mutual. So when he went back home, he called one day and asked if we would come and visit him and stay in his home uh, this spring. So we had, we were actually planning on maybe to going next year, but we thought, well, what an opportunity. So we went over this year and uh, stayed in an apartment of his in the little uh, West Bank village called Al Ram. Oh, what an opportunity that most people never get. Oh, yes. Yeah, and one of the things that was really wonderful about this particular visit, um, because we were staying as a guest mm -hmm. of a Palestinian um, you know, person, mm -hmm. um, we were part of the community. We, mm -hmm. When we've gone before, we've we've had mostly um, hotels that we stay in. Mm -hmm. We're with part of a group. When we went the first time, it was t to see my to see our daughter who had been there for seven months, uh, but we still stayed in a hotel and then used that location as our home base. Right. This time, we were very much integrated into the Palestinian community. Right. So it was a, a, a very different experience. You weren't so much outsiders looking in. You yes. were part of the inside mm -hmm. yes. being, being yeah. there all the time. Yeah, and one of the things that uh, was so important to me, one of the things I learned was being there four weeks, staying right uh, in Al Ram, I got a sense of what it's like to live under the occupation. Mm -hmm. And here I'm talking about just day-to-day -day life, not when a real raid is coming in on your house, not when they're shooting and all, just day-to-day. -day. And every day when uh, Yasser and I would get in his car and we would take off and we'd go normal speed for about three or four minutes and then we hit, hit the main checkpoint. Yeah. And um, we would sit in this long checkpoint for 20 minutes, 30 minutes, 40 minutes, 
get through it and then drive five more minutes and be at our destination. Mm -hmm. So a trip that should have taken about seven minutes takes about 45 minutes. Mm -hmm. And we'd do that when we'd go out, we would do that coming back. So I got a real sense of what kind of patience <laughs> is required <laughs> right. to live under that kind of regimen right. and what kind of um, struggle it is to deal with the air quality mm -hmm. because you're sitting there with sometimes two or three lanes of traffic and all, that and all of that, they're just sitting there mm -hmm. waiting on the checkpoints. Yeah. And so all these fumes uh, are going up in yeah. the air. And also uh. because there's inadequate services provided for mm -hmm. Palestinians, in this particular area there was uh, Kalandia, Al-Ram, and one or two other towns mm -hmm. whose names I don't remember. But among them, they made up around 70,000 people. They were comprised of 70,000. Mm -hmm. Now, officially, they're in what Israel calls East Jerusalem. So they pay taxes to Israel. Mm -hmm. However, Israel does not provide them with garbage pickup. Israel says, we can't do that because our workers wouldn't be safe. And they were asked, well, would you provide the money and we'll hire our workers to do it? And Israel would not do that. They allow the Palestinian Authority to operate one garbage truck per day and to service 70,000 people. Imagine if the town of city of Portland had <laughs> one garbage truck. So as a result, people have, uh, they got to do something with their garbage and the garbage gets put in lots or piled up and then it begins to get rancid and, and stink so they will burn it. So again, you have this Smoke air quality of open burning. Right. So it was important for me to experience that. Right. I'd like right. to say something about that as well. Mm -hmm. um, we stayed, uh, you know, at Yasser's apartment, and it's a beautiful, uh, there's a beautiful view from his sixth floor apartment. Mm -hmm. Twelve flights walk up. Yeah, right. <laughs> <laughs> and in this apartment building, there are many children. Mm -hmm. And um, like all children, there's the desire to play and to, you know, be, use your imagination and right. to and be so children. <laughs> they're children, but their their play area yeah. um, is 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 like as Bob described. Mm -hmm. There's a um, dusty roads that aren't paved because, again, of the lack of funding. Mm -hmm. There, uh, as you're walking into the apartment area. There's a, um, a bin uh, that is filled with trash. And overfilled. And overfilled. Mm -hmm. There um, is an area behind that where, where the trash has been blown. Mm -hmm. There are feral cats that are Just prolific, in, and, that yeah. are in and around there. Mm -hmm. um, as Bob said, there was one day in particular when uh, there, it was particularly foul, the mm -hmm. smell. There was some... Um, uh, refuse out there like chicken that was gone bad yeah. and you've got children playing out here yeah. and that is the norm this yeah. is the norm for these and you know, children there's yeah. another yeah. interesting story we encountered one day we went to Bethlehem and the um, a man named Mazen uh, who's the executive director of the Bethlehem uh, Development Foundation a very sharp man mm -hmm. uh, arranged for us to have a tour um, and so we went up to Batir, which is a small Palestinian village. The people of Batir use aqueducts built from the mm -hmm. Roman era. They mm -hmm. still use them. Mm -hmm. They have springs there. They use the water from the, those springs and that aqueduct to water their various family plots. There are eight mm -hmm. Palestinian families that have lived there for generations. And Sally asked this tour woman there, have the families gotten in disputes of, at sometimes over who gets enough water or we need more water? And she said, for my entire lifetime of being here, I've never mm -hmm. had a, seen a dispute. Mm -hmm. So one of the problems that they're dealing with though is what do they do with their refuse? Right. So they did an elaborate study mm -hmm. and they came up with plans for um, building, uh, getting a landfill and for money to, to get the truck to uh, take their refuse to this landfill. They had all the, they had to go through licensing permits with Israel to get that. So they did it and they were ready to go. And they had some international funding. I they think had some international funding. And then they learned from the state of Israel, oh, there's one more 
license that you have to get, a they permit were ready you to have go. to get. They were yeah. ready to go. And they yeah. said, this is a permit which you will get if you agree to pick up the refuse of the settlers who live down in that part of uh, the country. Mm. So if you'll go pick up their trash too and mm. put it in your landfill. Well, they hadn't designed their landfill to handle that. Mm. And so they had to just scrap it, yeah. uh, had to scrap it. Uh, so that's one of the, the frustrations that frustrations. Palestinians are yeah. dealing with. Yeah. The, uh, a, a man who is a, um, a, an engineer, uh -huh who was showing us a road that was being built around some of the terraces. These terraces go back to three to 3,500 years. Mm -hmm. And uh, he showed where the town, uh, an area where the town had saved up its money and had blacktopped about two kilometers of that. Um, that was gonna help them when they harvested their crops for market mm -hmm. to deliver them. And uh, Israel sent a bulldozer in and just tore up two mm. kilometers of blacktop. It's hard to imagine how that's improving the security yeah, of Israel. Right. But I mm. mention these things again to say, here is some of the frustration mm -hmm. that Palestinians living under the occupation are dealing with. Right, and by being there, you felt this. I wanna go back a little bit to the checkpoint mm. that they have mm -hmm. there. When you went through with your host, mm -hmm. Um, and you have to show your passport. Were, were you questioned um, a little bit more than you would have thought? Not at the checkpoints. Uh -huh. um, at the checkpoints, they, they looked at my passport, they looked in, looked at me, and then said, okay. Now, when we were coming into mm -hmm. Israel, though, at right. the airport, we presented our passports to the woman sitting behind in the little booth and she asked us, as they always ask people, why are you here? And I think she at some point asked, who are you staying with? Mm -hmm. So we told her that we were staying with Yasser Abadiah. And well, that name, I guess, if you, if you mention a Palestinian name, some red flags go up. So she kept us standing at that booth for what, 15 or 20 mm -hmm. minutes? Mm -hmm. And then some people or two people came over, one person, and she handed our passports to him and said, follow him. Mm -hmm. So we went to a little room where we sat for close to an hour. And then a man came and called me out and I went to a separate room and he asked me a series of questions like, why are you here and who are you staying with? And I gave the same answers I gave before. And um, so he had some questions about uh, Yasser and this kind of thing and then said, okay, you can go back now. And the whole time we were talking, he was on his computer. So yeah. I do not know what he was looking at, what yeah. he was finding. Um, but I went back to the room and then maybe a half hour mm -hmm. later, uh, the same man came to the door and motioned us out and gave us our passports and said, you can go. And there was no explanation no, as to no, why. No. I had heard that um, in general, it is difficult that, mm -hmm. that you are mm -hmm. either searched or yeah. questioned a lot longer yeah. than um, you would what think. A, I'd like to go back to that, that mm -hmm. point about the checkpoints, right. though, because there were two incidents, though, that I, that I found um, distressing. Mm -hmm. uh, one, one time I was um, visiting with uh, a new friend there, a woman named Lama, uh, who has uh, four children and she, was, uh, she wanted to know if I wanted to go with her to pick her children up at school. Right. And I went along with her. On um, the way back through the checkpoints, so the way, th um, the right way out, we had no, that we weren't st stopped mm -hmm. at all, but the way back, uh, we had to show our pass, I had to show my passport and Lama has a Palestinian ID that she needed to show. Mm -hmm. And Lama is searching in her pocketbook. She's searching and searching. She cannot find it. She takes everything out, and I can. I'm watching her. She's not saying anything, right. but I'm. You know, I'm very aware of body language. I'm mm -hmm. a psychotherapist, and I also, and I'm so I'm very tuned into those kinds right. of things. And I'm watching this anxiety. Mm -hmm. And at one point, she looks at me and she said, "I changed my bags earlier, and." My pat, my ID was split in half. You know, the cover of it was separated. Mm -hmm. And she said, I took the wrong one. Oh. So she, they had her pull over. And 
uh, a young woman, uh, you know, usually the, the soldiers who are um, standing at the checkbook points are between the ages, I would say, of 18 and 21, let's mm -hmm. say, for example. A young woman comes and she looks at, uh, she looks inside and Lama says, I don't have it. And she said, and she explained why. And luckily, the woman, the Israeli soldier was fine, mm -hmm. was smiled and said, that's okay, have a good day. Uh -huh. But what Lama said to me after what was, it would have depended on who came to, up to the window right. as to what would have happened. Uh. And then one other experience was when we were with Yasser and it was one, it was a very busy day. That It was a very congested um, a period of time at the checkpoint. Mm -hmm. um, and we're going through, there's, uh, there is a lot, you can feel the tension in the air because mm -hmm. people are waiting and waiting and waiting. Mm -hmm. And at one point, Yasser is doing what everybody else is doing, moving wherever there's a space. And this car comes up to the side and uh, out jump to men. One is in his soldier attire and the other is pulling out a bulletproof vest from the back of the car. Ugh. And he comes up, they come up to Yasser and they say, give me your ID. And Yasser's saying, what did I do? What did mm -hmm. I do? And the driver says, you cut me off, you cut me off. And we're thinking, he did what? You know, because yeah. we're watching everybody doing the same thing. Right. So I don't know what that all was about, mm -hmm. but it was very troubling because the man, uh, the soldier said, took a picture of his, of his uh, cell phone. Mm -hmm. He said, I'll see you in court. Oh. Um, and when Yasser was inquiring as to why, he said, you keep it up and there'll be another, there'll be another mm -hmm. charge mm -hmm. against mm -hmm. you. Mm -hmm. And it will make it even more difficult for you. Mm -hmm. it, it was harassment. Yeah. I mean, the, and, I, and I just, ah, it, was, it was very painful to see this happening. Yeah. And this is something that they're living under that anxiety of having oh, yeah. hap happen yeah. any time. Yeah. Yeah. And now that he's been targeted in a way, mm -hmm. yeah. he'll probably have even more anxiety. Yeah, yeah, exactly. I mean, so you think about a whole community of people living with that Mm -hmm. And you know how yeah. you f you are when you're under mm -hmm. anxiety. It oh, just yeah. depletes you in all ways. Yes, and your your everything falls mm -hmm. apart. Mm -hmm. yeah. And to have a whole community living like that every mm -hmm. day. Yes. You know, I in, in the states here, I'm traditionally been the kind of person that speaks his mind. Mm -hmm. And if I feel that I'm being treated unjustly, or somebody close to me is being treated unjustly, I speak up rather forcefully. And I realized when I was there for this month and not going through with a tour group, but just there as a person with an ordinary person there, that when I came to a checkpoint or any other place where there were Israeli police or soldiers around, I realized that um, I, couldn't, I couldn't exert my rights and demand my rights mm -hmm. in the way I can here. Yeah. Could not do it. And it could be some 18, 19 year old kid who's being rude. And this time I didn't have anybody treating me that way. But I know at times they do treat people that way. And I realized though, e even when we were waiting in line for 45 minutes, mm -hmm. if I'd been back here, I think I would have wanted when I get up there to say, would you explain to me why this is yeah. happening? Yeah. Is this really necessary? But you and I realized I could no. not do right. that. I you had didn't, well, you didn't feel the freedom to I do that. I didn't feel the freedom to do that. I realized if I protest, mm -hmm. they can yank me out of that car, put me in jail, yeah. or just deport yeah. me in, in an instant. And that's kind of a, transition into what happened while you were there. Mm. It's when the three young <clears throat> boys mm -hmm. went missing. Um, do you want to address that a bit? It's, it's a big concern for everyone. It's, it's, it's world news. Um, yeah. Nobody knows what has happened. Right. Um, but you were actually there. Uh, Sally, I think maybe you had come back. I at had that come back, point. so I was following it. You were following it from, from here, here. Mm -hmm. yeah. and Bob was following it yes. from there. And were you in touch with each other about the various ways 
news is, is projected when something like that mm -hmm. happens. Yes. Um, tell us, Bob, when you first heard of it. Well, um, I heard about it from my friend Yasser because he's reading the news every day in Arabic. Mm -hmm. And he told me that it happened. And my first reaction was, oh, no, mm -hmm. no, no, please don't tell me this has happened because the Palestinians don't need this. My hope, and it has not proven to be true, but my hope was that, okay, if some Palestinians <clears throat> did kidnap these three boys, I hope what they do is keep them for 24 hours and then call a press conference, release them, and say, we had no intention of harming these kids. We simply wanted to get the world's attention to the fact that our children are being kidnapped every day, mm -hmm. every day, and the world is not making a clamor about it. Mm -hmm. I think that would have been such a great statement for mm -hmm. the Palestinians to made. Unfortunately, they're not seeking my advice on how to mm -hmm. do things, and they have their own timetables and their own rationale. Now, so far, it's just alleged that they're kidnapped. My own guess is that they have been, um, but there's a, what distresses me is that in our media, there is no context provided for this, and context is extremely important. Um, three Israeli settler youth were, let's say, kidnapped. We'll just assume that for the mm -hmm. moment. Okay, that's, that's awful, that's bad. It should not have happened. But once we've said that, we've not said all that needs to be said in order to have a fuller understanding of what has, of the dynamics here. Mm -hmm. For one thing, people need to know, and I, I read this information when I was over there. This is the Haaretz, let me open this up so people can see. It's the Haaretz, or Haaretz, Haaretz newspaper. It's the most, um, some would say it's the most prestigious newspaper, mm -hmm. and some people in, in Israel, some have called it the, uh, the New York Times of Israel. It's a progressive newspaper. And so I was following what was going on in this paper because they put it out in English as well as in the Jew Jerusalem Post. And one of the things that um, was written about in Haaretz is that Israeli settler youth like to hitchhike in the West Bank mm -hmm. as an ideological statement. And I found this in a paper, um, a gentleman by the name of Nitzan Nuriet, mm -hmm. who's a former uh, director of the Counterterrorism Bureau of the Israeli Prime Minister's Office. And he told Israeli television that these settlers, for them, hitchhiking was also an ideology, a statement about who owns the West Bank territory which Palestinians and most of the world considered occupied. Mm -hmm. So there, it, it's a kind of thumb in your face right. to, to say we will, we can hitchhike and if, um, right. if something happens to us, our army will come in. So right. it's a challenge. Right, and that's, and, and, and we want to clarify too that we're making an assumption that these kids were doing that. We don't know that. We right. don't know what right. these three right. teenagers were doing there, or do we? Right. No, we don't, no, we we don't, don't know, know about their, these right. particular ones. Right. We just know that this charge was not made by Right. A, a Palestinian. It right. was made by an Israeli right. who's Just in the counterterrorism. These things right. do go on, and, and as you say, there's a, a much bigger picture that we're only mm -hmm. seeing a little mm -hmm. part of, and we make assumptions on that little part yes. we exactly. see. Exactly. Um, but we also have to realize too that Palestinians are not all the same. Mm -hmm. Americans are not all the same. Right. We all have different ways of doing mm -hmm. things and different ways of dealing with things, right. and we don't know. Mm -hmm. Who took these children? Who, right. who they are? What their motives are? Whether I know that the, there's there's um, disagreement in Palestine with the 
with the government of Palestine mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. and their co co cooperation mm -hmm. with the Israeli government mm -hmm. on trying to find these yeah. right. young people. So it's we've got a lot of things happening yeah. here. I'd like to say just one thing about this too right. is uh, again, it, the, like as you said earlier, mm -hmm. this has um, is taking world the world is 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 paying attention mm -hmm. to this. But how often do we know about the children that uh, the Palestinian children that are being are being taken from their homes right. two three o'clock at night. 12 to 16 years old on a regular basis, right. almost just daily. Just breaking down just and taking, taking them. Just taking them. Or the, 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 uh, the killing mm -hmm. um, of Palestinian, innocent Palestinian people. There's a kind of collective punishment mm -hmm. that's happening right now as we speak. And the, um, and the news we get, as you say, does not no. let us know that. No. So maybe this, this occurrence that, that is not a good thing that has happened, but it might bring about more dialogue, as you two are, are speaking mm -hmm. about now, about what is happening there. I would like to hope so, yeah. although this kind of thing has happened before. Yeah. And, uh, you know, and so yes, right. we need more, we right. need to have, we need to right. have all of the story. Right. We need to understand that violence and oppression only leads to vi more violence and oppression. Mm -hmm. It does not end in um, in a healthy way. You know, we can yes, there can be peace there, but it, it would be an oppressed peace right. if it, there needs to be full human rights for right. all people of the region. Right. And 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 there there's not. Right. Um, everybody everybody wants to live in peace and to be happy. And they um, should have a right to do that. But it, it, so this is the kind of occurrence that happens mm -hmm. that is very tragic. And as Bob was saying, we need to hear all of the story. Mm -hmm. We need to open our hearts it's true. for all people to un try to understand why this kind of thing right. happens. Right. And to look at our own hard edges when we mm -hmm. hear the word Palestinian. What happens inside of us? Right. You know, for many people, there's this automatic association right. with they're bad. Yeah. But that's where we need to. Mm -hmm. And that goes along with our support of Israel. Yeah. You know, oh, yeah. in our in mm -hmm. this country and the the lobby. Yes. To support right. Israel yeah. on at any cost, mm -hmm. really. Exactly. And we need to rethink that. We need to yeah. think about yeah. what are we doing. Yeah. As long as we don't have our troops in there, we don't really yeah. worry that right. much about it. Yeah. Um, I, I know we we don't have much time, so I want to kind of transition into why you were there, because this, to me, being with the Buddhist group, mm -hmm. plays into this this bigger whole of peace and love and giving. And, and understanding. Mm -hmm. Could you say a little bit about that? Yes. I met with two people, one in particular that I'll mention. His name is Stephen Folder, mm -hmm. up in Khalil, up in the northern part of Israel. He was the founder, really, of the Buddhist community as it began mm -hmm. um, many, many years ago. I asked him, you know, for his advice, for his perspective, that sort of thing. And, and he, he said a couple things. One is, that in his experience, um, Jews in Israel uh, are um, quite ignorant of what happens in the West Bank. That there is some willful ignorance, which is a turning the head and not wanting mm -hmm. to see. There is deep fear because of you know what Jews have experienced historically. And that there is great denial and guilt that is down, the guilt is, is, is buried deep inside. And he's, he's quite concerned about that. Yeah. Um, I think we might have to wrap yes. this up. And so mm -hmm. if you want to end that, I, yeah. I, yeah. So, we could so, go on for another yeah, hour. Yeah, right. I mean, so my intention is that, that this, the, this dialogue with mm -hmm. the Buddhist communi community in um, Israel is continuing. I think it's and wonderful. Yes. And maybe you'll... Come and back I have a blog about that. I would like to mention my blog, Buddhist Travels in the Holy Land, which uh, are reflections of my of my trip through the lens of Buddhist teachings. Okay. So my hope is that 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 will be an ongoing dialogue thing as well. I think that's great. Do we have a minute? 
we have really like a, not even a minute. Okay, I just <laughs> want to emphasize the importance, and I wish I had more time to give the context. The number of Palestinian children who are killed, who are kidnapped, and we don't hear about those. So we hear about this, this happened recently, and then the public is inclined to say, how awful those Palestinians are. Look at them, they're, once again, they're, they're right. causing trouble. Right. You think that way when you're not getting the, the full story. Picture. I yeah. agree. Okay, well, thank you both. Thank you. And thank I know you. that people can go to your webpage mm -hmm. yeah. and your blog and They can find go to Main more. Voices for Palestinian right. Rights website. And I would like to invite you both back to continue this conversation. We would love it. And um, soon. Thank Good. you. Thank, thank you. you very much. Bye-bye.